Namaste, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you again. I am always delighted to share in worship with my friend, my colleague, Yopa. Master, a God fearing man, in the name of God. Elder Bailey has served with great distinction and honor. And when he calls, it's always a moment of humbleness for me to be able to worship with him. And even though he's not with us today, we pray for him and his family, with his congregation. I want to welcome a friend of mine, Kay, who's on. Thank you for your continued prayers and support. Let us pray. Eternal Father, we are grateful for the summit that in your mercy, you have brought us into these sacred hours to worship you so that you may prepare us as a people for your kingdom. But while we that we may be equipped to demonstrate to the world who you are, so that through us you may prepare others for your kingdom. We ask, O oh God, that your spirit today would prick our hearts and convict so that we will surrender our wills to you, so that you may have full sway in our lives. So anoint your word again with power and conviction. Bring us into conformity to so, O oh God, that you may be glorified in all the earth. And men and women may come to call you blessed, Lord and Savior. We pray this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Collins, it was a delight. Thank you for praying with me. As we come to the worship hour of God, we come only through the strength and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. We live in an age that is, and when we look at ourselves, God has also asked us to learn the lessons of history. The Bible says that whatsoever things were written aforetime, Romans, were written for our learning and understanding, profitable that we may be able to avoid the pitfalls, to use the stepping stones, and to be wise in our daily choices so that God may be glorified. Somehow, the lessons, we hear them, we recite them, we study them. This week's Sabbath school lesson was an illustration, another illustration of that. When we look at the lesson of Asia, Israel and God's call to ancient Israel. And I ask a question, are we unlike ancient Israel? Or are we stepping in concert with them in their relationship to God's truth and God's word. It records a story that asks us to examine where we stand with God. And why do we do this? Why do we wake up on this morning of sunlight When the rest are around these activities and decide that we must come to a place of worship, whether it's a physical building called the edifice or we worship by the virtual church, but we assemble so that we may give. Why do we do this? What does this mean to you and to me? Is this merely an exercise or is this an experience that has some deeper meaning? Ritual, one 
program feature after the next? Do we come because of relationship we have? That bids us to come and that we cherish as significant and meaningful to our development. In the Bible, one of the more tragic stories recorded is in Luke chapter two. The Bible says that something happened that should not have happened, that was unimaginable, but it happened, and life tends to do that to us. We often find ourselves in situations or circumstances that we, that we could not predict, that we would not have imagined, but there we are. The Bible says that the parents of Jesus made the their way to Jerusalem for three annual feasts in Israel that every devout Jew in, in, in standing would attend. The Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of the Passover. And this was the Feast of the Passover. And Joseph, Jews, prepared for days. They planned, they packed. They were careful in, in their preparation. They made sure that everything was provided for. Or everything was in place because they were good. You see, my friends, Jerusalem represented the presence of God. For in Jerusalem was the temple. And it was at Jerusalem that the God should kind of glory represented his care for these his people who were chosen him in the earth. Chosen not because they were worthy, chosen not because of anything special, but because by his grace, by his mercy, he decided these people I will use to represent me in the earth. And so as they, with excitement and anticipation, joining them for the first time in his life is the boy in his conscious life. Because he had not been to the temple since he was eight days old, offered up as a child, as a baby, offered him. But he'd heard the stories along the way from year to year as the parents went and came back. They would tell the stories and the excitement and the joy and the, and, and, and the pleasure they got. out of going to the fast, he would build with hope that one day I too will join them. One day I too will join them. And finally that moment had come, for at the age of 12, every young man in the Jewish economy was taken to be taught of the rabbi. That child would become a part of the economy, the community. Jesus is now 12 years old, and with anticipation and excitement, finally, the moment had arrived when he would no longer have to listen to the stories when they came back. Oh, what anticipation. Oh, what thrill. What, what, what sense of, of, of pleasure awaited him. And as they journeyed, they would not take the most direct route to Jerusalem because the most of them direct route through the territory of the Samaritans. And the Jews and the Samaritans, even though related, were not friendly with each other, were not connected in any kind of relationship. There was tension and enmity. It's interesting now, the, the, the war, the, the missiles and the bombs, and these are brothers, half brothers. This is family that's fighting. We can tell a different story at another time with Abraham who made the choice. But what you see, my friends, is this, this is historic. It's a today. It's as old as the ages. 
And it started with a choice, a choice that now has a continuing ripple effect upon the world and the nations of the world in the sense of honor, the sense of being special, the sense that they were better than because they were the chosen ones. They were the ones who were the repositories of God's truth. They were the ones that God had entrusted to carry the message. God had given Israel nine blessings and had they been faithful to God and done the work of God because not only were they chosen, but they were to be priests. And the priest is to give service to The priest is to provide ministry. The priest proposes the gifts for the benefit of others. Had they been faithful in representing God to the world, the, the heathen nations would then come and inquire, tell us about your God who has blessed you. But because they were unfaithful, those of separation, they built barriers and hoarded the blessings for themselves. Their witness failed. And one of the people that they locked out, that they built, put up a wall, a partition between them. Was the Samaritans, you know, the story John at the well, and the disciples wondered, why are you talking to her? The wall of partition was there. And because of that wall of partition, they did not take the direct route to Jerusalem. They took a circuitous route, which added time and distance to my friends you see and this is not a, a racial issue because they are the same pigment they're people of the same family genealogy it's an ethnic issue if the problems of ethnicity have a long All played humanity because they're today worshiping here may have those prejudices in our heart. We just don't like some people and we don't know why we don't like them. We don't like them because they're different. We don't like them because they're their nationality. We don't like them because of their cultural background. We don't like them because of their pigmentation. We just don't like them. And we come to what's fascinating, painfully fascinating is that these people are going to Jerusalem to worship God with prejudice in their hearts. Here are people going to give glory to God to celebrate the feast of the Passover, others who were made in the image of God. Here are people who will enter into the sanctuary, into the presence of a holy God, but their hearts are not clean with others. They come, with, they come with wrath, they come with jealousy, they come with pride and hypocrisy, they come with a sense of I could destroy you rather than, than connect with you and bond with you, I rather push you away. Men and women going to the wonderful feast, come journeying, prepared, dressed. Everything is in place, but the hearts are not right. Oh, I must wonder. Which one of us this morning have entered into this fellowship with a heart of resentment, a heart that is embittered, a heart that sees people as other, a heart that feels a sense of superior, a heart that is indifferent to the, 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 the struggle and the suffering of other people, a heart that cannot give others unconditional regard. We take God's unconditional grace to us. God holds us to what Carl Rogers called unconditional positive regard, but unconditional positive regard. We have certain paradigms we have certain cultural mores we have certain preferences and if people don't fit into the particular box that we've carved we reject them we push them aside we ignore them we put them down we trust this morning 
I've come into this fellowship to worship God, but the heart is not right. They're sitting together, they're worshiping, they're praying, they're singing, but our hearts are not one because we can't stand somebody. We might as well not fool ourselves. We may all call ourselves African-Americans, but we don't like each other because depending on where you were born, were you from Africa, were you from Jamaica or Barbados or Trinidad or Mississippi or New York or Canada, determine how we relate to one another. And we see each other's threats. We don't see each other's family. And we like to talk about what others have done to us, but my friends, very often what others have done to us, we do to each other also. The Jews and the Samaritans were of the, the same racial makeup, but they could not stand each other because the Jews felt they were special. The Jews felt they were important. They were chosen. And everybody else, then we reached the place where we see people as other, the otherness. My friends, we deny the fact that God is our creator. For God did not make any other. God made humankind. And every man or woman born in our cultural differences, regardless of pigmentation, regardless of education or social status, regardless, my friends, of genealogy, we all are made in the image of God. And because we are made in the image of God, we all deserve unconditional positive regard. Because my friends, it's only by the grace of the other. But this otherness caused the children of Israel to reject the Samaritans. And as they journeyed, avoiding the Samaritans, this very issue not only was an issue that caused division, but you see, the human heart cannot be divided. For who we are is who we are. And when you cherish prejudice, and bias and one aspect and bias in another aspect of life, and this prejudice and bias that caused them to avoid the Samaritans will show up later in the story as a gender issue. Because as they journey, The young boys, the father or the mother, and they would climb along the way. And as they climbed the hill and saw the temple in the distance, their voices were heard to acclaim the great Hallel, all of peace and prosperity be within thy palace. All feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Peace and prosperity be within thy wall. Here are people going to worship and give glory to God. Can't stand. Each. And it's in this environment that a tragedy unfolds. For the Bible says that he who was least expected to be lost was lost. You see, my friends, had you told Mary and Joseph before they left home, that this child, angel spoke, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. This child that she bore for nine months, this child that the Bible says was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we be Held his blood. This child who is God with us, the child that the Holy Spirit implanted in her womb, this gift of God is lost. Oh, Jesus, gentle, meek, and mild had never caused them an anxious moment. They had no reason to think that he ever would. He was an obedient child. He was a respectful child. He was a caring child, but he's lost. This child who the angel said, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. This child who has come into the world for special purpose is lost. 
And he's lost by one who should not have lost him. But Jesus was not lost by a babysitter. He was not lost at the daycare center. He was not lost by an aunt. Or he was lost by his mother. He was lost by the one person who had an intimate relationship with him. She He knew what it meant to carry chains of labor. She knew on that night of birth, when they went to the hospital and there was no room there, the doctor was not an attendant. My friends, they knew they didn't have any care for these. Sterilized sheets and, and, and Jesus was born in the basement of a burnout tenement. He was born in an abandoned building. He was born where the roaches run, crawl and the rats run, where the hypodermic nasal are and the bear cans rest, where the wine bottles are. So he was born so low that night can get beneath him. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. It doesn't matter what our condition was. It doesn't matter where we come from. He was born so low that none of us have an excuse for the lives that this is sufficient. He understands your circumstances. He's mindful of our condition. He cares about each, the details of our lives. And my friends, because Jesus' birth is such, He can be touched in infirmities, poverty, opportunities denied, injustice experienced. Because Harold wanted to kill him. Mary knew how she had to run to Egypt. She knew my friends that this child special, and yet she lost him. Which one of you? Which one of us? Taking our young child to the mall. Do not make sure that the child is in front of us. Hold on to the dress. Hold on to the hand in the stroller. Which one? Particular to look after the precious children in our lives. But he was lost by his mother. And it's not an indictment on mothers. My friends, because Ellen White makes a statement, not even the pastor in his appointed course of duties or the king of his throne is, has a more important work than that of the mother. She says the mother's name may never be written in the world, may never go up in neon lights of the world, Adventures of Fame. So the mother's work is critical and important to the shaping of character. So it is a mother's responsibility to shape the character of the children. And yet he's lost. And so it's not a diminishing, it's not my friend, it's a fact that if Mary, who, who was so intimate about the details of his life, could lose him, how much more could you and I? who are so far from him, could lose him. Did we bring him with us this morning? Are we sure that he's with us? Or have we taken it for granted? But not only was he who was lost, lost, but one who should not have lost him, He was lost my first. Jesus was not lost at some ordinary event. He was not lost at the picnic. He was lost at the most significant festival in the nation's experience. He was lost at the feast of the Passover. They prepared It was a spiritual, it was a time, my friends, of refreshing. It was a time that reminded them of when God delivered Israel from Egypt, from the bondage of slavery symbolic of man's deliverance from sin. And they were told to, com to commemorate this and teach it to the children from generation the goodness of God who had delivered them out of Egypt in bondage. And so the feast of the Passover became a significant point in the history of the experience. And yet it was at this important festival
that represented God, that he was lost. Why? Remember the night when God was about to deliver them and the angel of mercy came and every doorpost that had blood sprinkle on it was spilled. The little girl said to dad, dad is a the blood there. And he said, yes. But she was troubled. She goes, said, dad, are you sure the blood is on the mantle? Yes, my child. And she came and said, Dad, let's look. Are you sure the blood is there? That there's no remission of sins. And that night of mercy, Jesus comes to the very feast that represents his sacrifice. Because you see, the night of Passover, the blood on the doorpost was the blood of the unblemished lamb. Lamb of God, John said, here's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Here comes the Lamb of God, and the Lamb is lost at the very feast that represented him and his sacrifice. My friends, we must ask the question. If the Lamb is lost, what blood shall we use as an atoning sacrifice? If the Lamb is lost, how shall there be a remission of sin? Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. My friends, when we lose Jesus, we have no salvation. It is possible, possible to do the ceremonial things. It is possible to, yes, even on the Sabbath day, to be in the right place. But without the Lamb. Where is Jesus What do we know where he is? Is he with us? Because we entered into the Ephesus or because we've, we, we, we've clicked on the link and we're now in a fellowship together, do we know where the lamb is? Have we come through the blood? Are we covered with the blood? Or are we merely going through our ritual? Are we merely here, my friends? Because it's the habit. The feast of the Passover had become the habit. But he was lost. Who should lost him? At a time, he should not have been lost. In a place, he should not have been lost. See, he wasn't lost at the racetrack. He wasn't lost in the number shop. He wasn't lost on the hotel bed of adultery. He wasn't lost in the bar. He wasn't Lost my friends on the stage. But when they came to Jerusalem, there was the temple in all its resplendent glory. And in the temple was the Shekinah glory of God. The ark of the covenant representation saying to the world that we serve a God almighty, a God who is the I am, who's active in our lives because he knows our past and he's cleansed us of our past. He's taking care of us our present. He says, take no thought, don't worry. And he promises a future, the tour that which we lost. This is our God. Who can stand against him? He has delivered us. Sabbath school lesson this week says he's bore us up with eagle, let eagle wings. He's carried us to heights sublime. They came to the temple. They came to the place that was a sense of pride, was a sense of honor. They came to the place that gave them, that validated who they were. We were the chosen of God. And yet in the church, God is lost. God is lost in his own church. Hmm. See, because we enter the edifice, because we've clicked in on Zoom, does not mean that God is with us. It's possible, you and me, to go through two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours, all day in the right place, doing the right thing without God. Because if it's only ritual, 
example and ceremony and if our hardness and anger towards others if we see others as other if our cultural or national mores and values if our genealogy if our social status or educational level If my friends, those things be six of our lives that causes us to harbor in our hearts deceit and strife. Paul in 1 Corinthians 3 3 says, Are you not carnal when there's envy and strife and division among you? What is your influence in the congregation? When you show what happens, in the strife me. Are you the one who envy the success of others? Can you celebrate other people's accomplishments? They get the position, the nominated committee says, you take that position, you don't take that. What is your attitude? Do you use your influence to divide the congregation? God is not present, sometimes in his own church, because the men and women who make up the church are not godly. In the Sabbath, School notes this week. She says, Not everyone is a child of God. Some are the children of Satan. My friends, if you and I have lost Jesus, we are not children of God because we were born with us. But he was lost when he should not have been lost by one who should not have lost him. At a time he should not have been lost, in a place he should not have been lost, in the church. I wonder. How many men and women, because of you and me, and the way we treated them. I wonder. How many people have lost their way in the church. Because of our example. Or lack of it. If God is worshiping with us, then we assemble. Because there's a difference between worship and religious exercise. Element makes a step. She says that she was so, shown a place and she looked upon the rostrum. I mean, she looked on the rostrum. There was no light coming from it. There was darkness there. But if the Shekinah glory of God is not reflected in us, worship does not occur. You see, my friends, and God is never present when his people are not humble and contrite and penitent and repentant. God is not present in envy and strife and Division. God is not present. God is not present when we're indifferent. God is not present in our worship when our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. God is not present. Even though we may do the ritual and the ceremony. She said the angels came to a certain place and when they got to the door, and they saw what was going on inside. They held their light close to their bosoms. And backed away because the spirit of God was not there. Now we like to say, oh, the church is dead. The church is cold. And that might be true to you. But it's only true to you. you because you're dead and you're cold. If God is in you, you never lose your joy because it's one of the gifts of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit. So when the joy is gone in worship, when the mind has no peace, when we cannot find, don't point the finger, don't look and say, Lord, where am I today? What's going on in my life? that has made this so dull and so dry that I can't find any joy 
in the Lord. Now, present, the angels don't show. I just wonder, is God with us today? But he was lost, who should not have been lost by one who should not have lost him. At the time, he should not have been lost. He should not have been lost. His house. Imagine being lost in your own house. Because he was lost in a way, in a manner, that he should not have been lost. The Bible says that when the feast was over, And chapter 8 of the Desire of Ages paint a phenomenal story about this passage of scripture. Ellen White says that when the feast was over, Mary and Joseph got caught up. In the temporal, I'm a thief, forgot the spiritual. Oh, I like your car. Let me show you the new car I just got yesterday. You know, I got a promotion. You know, we are moving across town. We, we move into a bigger part. Your child, I like your dress. Oh, what a nice hat you wear. Oh, boy. Boys, mm, some trend. We going on vacation, you know, just graduated. And they got caught up in temporal and material conversation. And she said, as they were leaving the temple, the little boy... They heard the conversation itself from their presence because it was all temporal and material and social and secular and did not focus on the spiritual. Imagine church has just ended and they did what you and I do typically every week. The moment the benediction is said, the message is gone. And we now begin to talk about our lives. I'm leaving tomorrow. Cancun, we're going to Hawaii. You know, my boss told me on Thursday, he's giving me a promotion. I got to raise the thing. We begin to focus on us. And we become temporal and material and social. And the boy Jesus heard that conversation threw himself from there. And he went and sat at the feet of the doctors and lawyers, the teachers, as a learner. Here is the one who had all the wisdom, but he takes the position of humility. He sat down. He did not go to teach. He went to learn. Some of us can't learn anything. We don't have enough humility. To, we want to do the telling. Our opinion is the only one that matters. But here is this child, this all-wise one who is sitting Mary and Joseph absorbing worldly concerns. He returns. And that's why when they said to him, how could you do this to us? He said, in other words, you were not about the same things that I am interested in. He said, I'm interested in spiritual things. I want to prepare myself for the, for the glory of my father. But you got caught up. Listen to yourselves as the service ends. And ask yourself, what's your conversation? The moment the benediction is, God, says, is rendered, God is forgotten and we become preoccupied. Raise our hearts. And so he was lost in a way he should not have been lost because Mary and Joseph were not focused on right. And verse 49 says, we see not that I must be about the business of my father, things eternal. And that might make a statement. Selected messages, book two. She says, when the services of the aisles to talk, the bishop jostling and jesting, let the worshipers pass quietly from the seats, meditating upon what they just heard, the message. Meditating up in the prayer so that they take the message with them. My friends, when our services end, the marketplace opens. And it's right then that many of us lose the blessing that God gave us. We spend two, three hours. 
but we lose the blessing in a moment. And she goes on in that chapter to say this, that because Jesus' presence was not marked, his absence was not recognized. If you and I are not living with a consciousness of the presence of God, we don't even know where he's left us. Well, what, what happened? How could two parents lose the child? And this is the prejudice I talked about earlier, that one form of prejudice in the heart, opens the heart to in the story. You see, the men and the women did not travel together. The women traveled in one caravan and the men traveled in the next. And they both assumed, that's why the text in verse 44 says, but they suppose in him. Mary suppose, assume that he was with Joseph and Joseph agenda says they can travel together. My friends, when prejudice enters into the experience of the Christian, when prejudice enters our heart, whether it be ethnic or gender bias, it takes away the presence of God from our lives. God does not function prejudice. There are too many of you who treat women as if they are not a second class you have this air of superiority, this air of importance, and you see women as less than. You practice this gender issue and prejudice that made them make an assumption that was wrong. And therefore, they journeyed. And look at the story. The Bible says they make three days without Jesus. Can you imagine? And don't know that Jesus is not with you. You went to the temple, went to worship, did all the ritual, went through the ceremony, brought the offering, brought the sacrifice. Yes, we fulfilled the requirements. But God Jesus, the blood is lost. And she says it's only when night came that they began to look for Jesus. You see. It is when the trials and the affliction and the difficulties and the persecution and the disease and the sick recognize who is Jesus. Three days they went without him and did not know he was not with them. Well, how many days are you and I journey? members of the chosen, the remnant, but journey before God. How many days? And imagine now the anxiety that they fix me. That's why the word sorrowful means anxiously, because Mary remembered how Herod tried to kill him. She's now rehearsing all the things that had gone on to try to destroy it. Was he kidnapped? Did somebody take it? Where is he? Because they missed his helpfulness. But God is such a God of etiquette. He's not invited. He doesn't show up. And when his presence is not marked, he absents himself. We need to invite God into our lives every day. Because he was with us yesterday, there's no guarantee he's going to be with us tomorrow. Or even with his beloved, he will never choose. And maybe decide and you say to God, I don't need you. I don't want you. You being with me is not special. God says, okay, I'll, I'm not going to impose myself on you. You're free choice. I made you to make choices. I sits back and says, go ahead. And many of us in the church, in good standing, we can transfer your membership, are journeying before Jesus because he's not the sweetest thought in our lives. He's not the preeminent thought. He's not the priority of our lives. We go through the rituals. And it took them three days and they had to retrace themselves and they found him where they left him. God is always where we left him last. On the bed of adultery, on the bed of fornication. In the 
and the unresolved argument, resentful spirit. Where did you leave God last? There's a very interesting thing in Abraham's life that whenever Abraham made a mistake, he went back to the place of his last altar and started. Okay. Where was your last place of steps to this? Is God, this is where I left you. I need your forgiveness. I need your cleansing. And when they found him, rather than taking responsibility for their failure, they tried to blame him. He said, you brought me here to this. You left me. You lost me. I did not depart from you. God says, I, I, I'm here. I'm waiting for you. I've promised never to leave you nor forsake you. But you had other priorities. Kind of title. The sermon, misplaced part. So Ellen White makes a statement. Same chapter. Why do we lose Jesus? She says, idle talk. One. When we know more about Jeopardy, Ellen DeGeneres, and Tyler Perry, and Beyonce, when we know more about the Knicks and the Lakers, when we know more, my friends, about Alabama, no more about the care, the stock market, maybe no more about the economics of the nation than we do about Obadiah and Habakkuk and Micah and Zephaniah. We engage in either some of you, do you know the book? Can you find my friends Haggai? Do you know my friends what Joel said? Are you acquainted? with Zachariah. Because Jesus said we need to live by his word. Not only that, she says, I don't talk evil speaking. Now, I mean, I, I, I don't know you. So maybe I should assume that the people of the Ephesus church in Birmingham do not speak evil of each other. The respectful, courteous thing for me to do with him. I haven't talked to your pastor, but you don't know you. But I know human nature. Preach this gospel long enough around the world to know that. There's somebody in this congregation who slanders, who backbites, who gossips, who tears another person's character down. Because that's what human beings do who are not under the control of the Spirit of God. And she says, I could pray. I don't talk, evil speaking, neglect of pray. Well, it's a very interesting biblical equation. If you and I are neglecting prayer, it's always an indication that we're not studying the Bible. Because if you study the Word of God, it gives you something to pray about. It It gives you a command to obey. It gives you, it gives you something to say, glory, hallelujah. So if you and I cannot find something to pray about, check your moments in Bible study. Maybe we're not studying enough. Maybe we're not with the word of God. And therefore, when we're not spending time in the word and in prayer, all of this is just if the only gospel, if the only spiritual focus you and I have is what happens on a Sabbath morning, Jesus is not with us. Because the servant says that many a man and woman, many a person enters a religion and leaves even more destitute than when they first came. Here's what, what it means. That we come to church at the beginning of the service, but at the end of the service, they're more destitute than at the beginning of the service. That's sad. That you and I could just spend two hours here. And at the end of this, it's because we came before Jesus and we leave before him. So what's the point of coming? But there's good news. The Bible says, the 
if we repent and we have an advocate, my little children, I pray that you do not lose me. But if you lose me, I'm your advocate, First John 2. And if you repent and confess, I will cleanse you and he has offered us cleansing and forgiveness. Mary and Joseph found him. And when they found him, he united with them. When we rediscover Jesus, he doesn't reject us. He says, he that come after me, I will. When you come, seek you first the kingdom and his righteousness, and he will add all things unto us. He says, my friends, that he's able. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He will not turn his back. He invites us to come no less read. And together, he says, to some, All you that are serves, come drink of the water. Come, the invitation to you and to me, no matter how long we've left them or lost them, no matter what poor choices we've made, no matter the fact that he said, When we turn to him, he will in no wise cast us out. That's the good news, that is grace is everlasting. It's not by our works because we can do all the right things and lose him, but it's by a spirit of faith what you want me to be, but I repent, I confess, I ask your forgiveness. He says, when we come to him, he restores us. We may have done it all wrong for the last 20 years, 15 years, There's five years, 30 years. The last three days, we may have done it all wrong. The last week, or we may have gotten ourselves involved in sin. You know the sin. God knows the sin. Yes, but he says, when we come to him, he will know why he's cast us out. When we confess. And so the story is not a story of darkness and discouragement. It's a hopeful story that they lost him, who should not have been lost, the Passover. In the church, they lost him. In a way, he should not have been lost, preoccupied, misplaced priorities. But because he loves us with an everlasting love. What shall separate? Because he wants to have a covenant. Because God is long suffering and tender and mercy is not willing that any of us should perish. He says, Come, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Today, today, the good news that Jesus is right where we left him waiting for us with open arms, with tender heart. As a father pity of his children, so he pities us, saying, come, my child, come. And we can tell, we can put the robe, you put the robe on our back and the ring our fingers and kill the fatted calf and, and make a feast for this, my child, that was lost, has returned. And Ellen White says this. In the second last paragraph of that book, it would be well for us to spend but a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. Phenomenal statement. She says, my friends, you come change into the likeness of his image because Jesus loves us. He is more willing that we should be saved than we ourselves. He wants to take us home. She says, my friends, that we need to come to Jesus. Let me read the quotation for chapter eight. She says this in that last second from last paragraph. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. One hour. How much time? 
do we give Jesus? You know, when we go to sleep at night, when we look at our day, how much time have we given to him? The sin is going to keep most of us out of heaven. It's not adultery. It's not Sabbath breaking. It's not refusal to the return tithe. It's not. It's busyness. Most of us have got the ritual down right and got the right habits, but we're too busy for God. We don't have time for God. She said, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful of each day. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant. Our love will be quickened and the spirit. If we would be saved at the last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. As we associate together, we may be a blessing one to another. If we are crisis, our sweetest thoughts will be of him. We shall love to talk of his Our hearts will be softened by divine influences, prejudices of God, beholding the beauty of his character. We shall be changed into the same image from glory to glory. My friends, is what the prophet on the inspiration, at least one hour each day, making sure that Jesus is with us. I'm talking in a minute today doctrine we know the fundamentals we claim to be spiritual israel with a remnant we are we are eager to tell people i'm chosen i'm royal i'm holy i'm peculiar we speak that's right we eat right we walk right we are doing the right things but is jesus with us there's somebody today who wants to say, Lord, Lord, I confess, I have, I have not given you the time. I've been too busy for you. I'm in the church, but I'm preoccupied with the vanities of life. Lord, I'm living by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. My time, my talent, my temple, and my treasury, they put this morning. Are not dedicated to you. I'm spending time in your word and in prayer. Today, you want to. Every head is bowed, every eyes closed. You want to raise your hand and say, Lord, I repent. I confess my sin. I ask you to receive me. Forgive me, Lord. I want to journey with you. There's somebody who may never have accepted Christ. The day you says, I need him as my in my own strength. I want to live by the mercies of God. And to be truthful, there's maybe somebody here who's walking with Jesus. And then you want to say, Lord, I just want to renew my cup. I thank you for the time that I've asked you to give me the grace and to continue to journey with you. Three categories of decisions to make. You know yours, I know mine. Every head is about Elder Collins, Dr. Collins, would you? Amen, amen. Thank you, us, thank please. you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Pastor Carter. This was a message that I'm not sure about other people, but it's a message that I needed. And I thank God for you. Um, we'll now have benediction by Elder Ben Reapers.
I want to thank you, old caller, for this timely message for all God's people. Help us not to lose God because of the yes, vanities yes. of this. And now to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And that all the people of God say, Amen, Amen, and Amen again.